Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kyle Thomas here at CSBS. We are about to get started with the Connecticut release of the state examination tutorial. Well, we've got uh, an exciting agenda for you today. Uh, we want to welcome you to the call. Also remind everyone that we are recording today's call because we'd like to make these available after the fact. And uh, we think they're good, uh, good content if you have to miss a portion of it or if you need to share it with some examiners who uh, may be new to the system a little later on. So uh, in about a week, we'll get the we'll get an email out to you with a recording and uh, you'll be able to find it as well on the CSBS.org slash about SES site where you have the release notes. So we're going to jump in here in a minute. Uh, just a couple other housekeeping items. We have all the lines muted because we have about 150 people participating today, which is great. Um, but because that can get a little unwieldy with questions, we want to encourage you to use the chat feature if you have any questions and we'll be moderating that, monitoring that uh, throughout throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to get to questions as we get to them uh, through the agenda. So if, you know, if we're touching on scheduling and you ask a scheduling question, we'll try to go ahead and answer that right away. So let's get started. First things first, like we always do, what's included in the Connecticut release? Well, uh, this is a, a single sprint worth of work. So we have a few, uh, we have a smaller number of enhancements, but still a really good uh, and I think a lot of valuable enhancements. Uh, this this release comes quick on the heels of the New Hampshire release that you'll all remember it was just just a few weeks ago. So this one includes about 28 new enhancements features, uh, most of which were from end user feedback. We got a lot of feedback on the company side and a lot of feedback on the agency side, and then uh, that translates into 11 uh, agency facing changes, four for companies, and then 13 enhancements that really benefit all the users in the system. You'll see on the right hand side of the screen, our website there, that's where you can go to just, it's kind of a jumping off point for all, anything and everything related to SES. It's got uh, the release notes on it, has links out to a map showing which agencies are using different aspects of the system. And then it also takes you out to the knowledge portal and other, uh, other resources for you. So today we are gonna talk about a few of the, I would say cornerstone changes in this release. One of which uh, I'll be covering here in a second is accepting and leveraging another agency's supervisory activity. We'll also talk about some bulk download changes that we've made, uh, the uh, ability to add additional information to your standard information requests. That was a user, uh, a high priority user feedback item. That I think brings a lot of nice flexibility to the system. And then uh, how we're handling and what we're gonna be using depository institution data for, uh, some notification changes, and then ultimately some company company user verification as they uh, get into the system and associate themselves with, with the system. Well, let's get started. The first feature I wanna talk about is accepting and leveraging examinations of other agencies. And I have to give a little bit of backstory here. We, as you know, are talking at CSBS all about network supervision and working with, uh, working with other state regulators uh, to join exams, reduce the number of exams wherever possible. Um, so joining with your fellow exam or joining with your fellow states is one way to do it. Another way to do it is by taking the work that they have already done and building off of that uh, and using it to speed up your supervisory process. So we've got two features in the system that work to that goal. The first is accepting an examination of another agency. And I have to draw a bright distinction between these two because it's important to understand the conceptual difference between accepting and leveraging uh, if the words don't uh, convey that just off the bat. So accepting another agency's supervisory activity is really the outright acceptance of that agency's exam for your purposes. So let's say you're scheduled or you're due to examine company ABC and you're in the system and you see that someone has just, some other agency has just examined company ABC and they've closed that exam, and uh, you think, you know what, I know the regulators in that state, I work with them all the time, they're really good, and it, it's likely that what they reviewed is good enough for my purposes, and I might be able to just accept their report fully and wholeheartedly for my own purposes. That's the acceptance workflow that we've built. Now, we'll demo this here in a minute. I will, I will say, this may not be a common practice yet, but we're hoping to increase this as a common practice uh, as we go forward, and we certainly wanted to build this in the, into the system now. Contrast that with leverage, the leveraging functionality. This is probably a more common practice. It's, all, it's uh, contemplated in our accreditation standards. If you're a mortgage um, 
uh, bank or soon to be uh, money transmitter accredited, it allows you to use another agency's exam or investigation record as a starting point for your own exam or investigation. So think of it this way, if, if they've covered 90% of what you were gonna cover and you just need to do an additional 10%, maybe request a few loans or review a few transactions, the leverage workflow allows you to do that. The leverage workflow is essentially a new scope type in SES, which really allows you to do just that. You can say, for, the, for this examination of company ABC, I'm gonna call it the leverage scope type. You point to the exam of the other agency that you're leveraging. You can then you know, review and access that information carry out your own supervisory duties, whatever those mean to you, and then drive on. So that's kind of the two concepts in a nutshell. And I'd like to break away from the PowerPoint presentation now and demo this in the system. So this, this demo will take a little bit. Uh, we're gonna be jumping user roles and we're gonna be covering both of these two functions. Uh, so bear with me if we, if we get, a little, uh, get a little wild with the user role jumping around. I'll do my best to keep orienting you as I can. So I'm signed into the system now as a staff director from the state of Washington. And imagine, if you will, that I have to do an examination of a large company. Let's just call it Quicken. So if I have to examine this company, um, I need to find that company's record and initiate an exam on them. Uh, so this is one path, and, I, and I'm demoing the acceptance workflow right now. So we're going to pull up the company search. A couple different ways to go about it. Search by name, and you pull up that company's record. Now I mentioned there's a couple different ways to go about this. Um, one way is through the scheduling workflow, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm kind of uh, showing the the basic, uh, maybe more direct route to the acceptance functionality. So with the acceptance flow, uh, you first have to find the exam that you are going to accept for the purposes of your own, for your agency. So remember, I'm signed in today as Washington State. So I know I have to examine Quicken. Well, I need to find an exam that I can accept. And again, you may not know in your head uh, that another agency has done an exam of a company. I'm kind of showing you here a way you can go search for that. Um, I think in practice, you're more likely to run into this in the scheduling flow, which I'll show when we get there. But I wanted you to see how this works mechanically outside of the scheduling flow, because that adds maybe another layer of uh, another layer of of complexity when it comes to a demo. It's just another thing to kind of mentally keep track of. So as I was setting this up today, I found an exam that another agency has done on Quicken that is perfect for me to uh, take a look at. So I'm gonna pull up number 541. So exam number 541 was conducted by my neighbor to the south, Oregon, and it's in closed status, which means I can, this exam has completely run its course. I can go ahead and possibly request, or excuse me, possibly accept this for my own purposes. Now, in order to uh, accept another agency's exam record, you have to have access to it. Because this is an Oregon record, I don't have automatic access to it. So I'm going through the process now of showing you how to request access to these. And I'm gonna submit a request now over to the agency in Oregon. So now the agency in Oregon gets uh, a notification to approve my request. So now I need to sign out, sign in as Oregon and approve that request. Normally, you would not be uh, in the real world, I think, jumping around and, and doing all these different uh, role changes. But essentially, what I'm doing here is I've just logged in as an Oregon staff director. I'm reviewing Washington's request. They are making a request to, to give uh, the staff director in Washington and the examiner in Washington access to this supervisory activity. And so I, I can accept it or reject it. Again, um, we've covered this functionality in previous demos, so I'm kind of breezing through this quickly. Uh, what that just did is it just granted the Washington Department access to that examination record. So now I'm going to sign back in as the Washington Staff Director. And hopefully you're hanging with me here. Uh, back in now as the Washington Staff Director, I'm going to go and find that exam. It's exam number 541. And we see here 
pulls up because I now have access to it, and I can now open that record. So now this is the examination record from the state of Oregon. You'll see that I've got access to all the information on all these tabs. I can also view the report of exam. So in the report of exam tab, I could download and preview the final report of exam. Uh, you are limited to downloading and previewing other documents in the system. So loan requests, information request documents cannot be previewed by you. Uh, but the report, obviously, since that's the thing you're probably going to need to be reviewing as part of your acceptance exam, uh, is in fact included in your authority. So back on the summary tab, to initiate the acceptance of another agency's exam, you have to assign an acceptance EIC. So in SES, we treat the acceptance workflow as kind of a small exam, if you will. Um, it's, a, it's its own supervisory activity, essentially. It's its own, um, it's its own flow. Uh, and so we, what we heard from our, our stakeholders was that even in the situation where you're accepting another agency's exam outright, you have to still assign someone to review that other agency's work. You have to assign someone to complete maybe some forms or paperwork in your agency. And we just decided to use the term EIC for that. Uh, it was a known term. And so we were assigning an examiner in charge for that purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and assign myself. You could also assign any other users who have access to the supervisory activity. Uh, you saw there was another name in there, examiner one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and assign myself as the staff director and then click begin acceptance. So now we have uh, uh, begun the acceptance piece for um, the supervisory activity. Uh, there's a big button right in the middle of the screen that says begin acceptance. I'd assign, I'd assign myself as the, as the examiner in charge for this. And so by pulling up that same exam record, so this is the Oregon exam record, 541 of Quicken. Uh, this is the record that you know, I had requested access from Oregon on. Uh, you click begin acceptance and you, are opened or you're brought to a very simple form that allows your agency to document whatever you need to do um, as it relates to the acceptance of this other agency's report. And, and this, is, this is it. This is the entire workspace for your acceptance exam, if you will. And so you're able to provide any kind of acceptance notes here if you want to provide some written notes. But I think most important is this upload documents file. So what I want to encourage each agency to do who might want to use this functionality, because I think this has the potential to really save a lot of time, is your agency will need to come up with policies, procedures, and, and some practices around when it makes sense to accept and how your agency will document the acceptance of another agency's report. And so I've kind of created a mock form here called the Washington DFI exam acceptance form. And you can um, imagine I've filled that out and attach that. That form would probably collect things like, um, you know, the due diligence review that I've done, uh, document whether or not the, the company's followed up with any findings that the previous agency found, uh, that the scope was sufficient for my agency's scope, just documenting all the things that are necessary. You have the ability also to choose whether you want to notify the company that this has happened. And this is a choice because we heard in our feedback sessions that some agencies may want to do this, some agencies may not. But I think uh, to the extent that you, you think the company would appreciate the fact that you're not examining them in a full scope way and just accepting another agency's report, uh, you can send this notification. Uh, but if you also just don't want to do that, you can, you can choose no. Uh, the last part here, this should look pretty familiar. You can save your work. Send, uh, you can send this for review. So if you were an examiner level, you could send this up to a staff director or a staff user level and have them uh, review it and certify it if that's appropriate, or you can complete the work uh, by clicking the accept button and hitting accept supervisory activity. So again, I want to stress that it's a very simple workflow. You request the access from the other agency. Once you get that access, you assign your EIC, then the EIC completes that simple, that simple screen there. But really the meat of the review uh, would be whatever documentation or policies you create to guide your examiners through the acceptance review process of another agency's report of exam. So I mentioned that's the more, that's a very direct route. That's when you know the company you're gonna accept an exam of, you maybe even know the exam from the other agency that you wanna accept an exam of. That's jumping right into the system to take care of that. Um, I think in practice, this is more likely to come up in the scheduling uh, workflow. So I wanna take a few seconds and show that now. 
And this is a good segue into the other piece of this functionality, which is not only the leveraging function, or excuse me, not only the accepting function that I just showed you, but also the leveraging function, which is much more of a, of a workflow and much more of an, a feeling of an exam than the acceptance. Because remember, acceptance is outright taking the other agency's uh, report and using it for your own. And then uh, leveraging is possibly doing a lot of additional work building off of the previous agency. Okay, so I'm back on my home screen. I'm gonna show you how to kind of access those options from the scheduling uh, wizard. So this should look familiar because I think this was a, a workshop we did together last month. You start the exam scheduling and we're gonna go ahead and choose mortgage origination for today's demonstration and pull up all the mortgage companies licensed in the state of Washington. So I've, I've cheated a little bit. I set some of the stuff up ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna just, to keep things kind of quick and sane here, go through two examples of how to accept or leverage from the scheduling module. So you see uh, from, this, from the company selection page, I just picked two companies. Let's just imagine that I needed to examine Lend Smart Mortgage and First Second Mortgage Company out of New Jersey. So I've selected those two, go to the next step, confirm that those are the only two I wanna work with in this session, and then the next step is really this make decisions piece. This is where accept and leverage have come into the uh, come into the screen. So the first company is Lend Smart Mortgage, and you'll see there's a past supervisory activity on Lend Smart Mortgage. California DBO exam number 1011 uh, was conducted just about a month and a half ago. Just about a month ago. So. This, this, this screen, which I know we've talked about before, is, is designed to show you other information that you can use for your purposes in scheduling and working with this company. So we show you the active exams that you see, there are none. The upcoming exams, because these are two categories of exams that maybe you wanna partner with another agency on. And we can finally now use this past supervisory activities to accept or leverage. So in order to accept, you know that exam has to be closed and that this one is, same with leverage. So with this one, with LendSmart, I'm gonna choose the leverage option. And you plug in the supervisory activity ID, that was 1011, tab over. California's are good examiners. So we're gonna go ahead and say, good fit to build off of this one. And then you go to the next company. Again, I hope you remember this from the scheduling workshop. Right now, you're not actually putting these decisions on the on the calendar. All you're doing is you're just saying how you want to handle each of these companies in your scheduling queue. First, second mortgage company of New Jersey. There are no past supervisory activities, so I cannot accept any. Uh, I cannot accept any supervisory activities of this company, but I could use uh, use this upcoming one conducted by New Jersey and join it if I wanted to. Um, but if I wanted to accept. The way this would work is you would just click accept, plug in the supervisory activity ID there, and then you'd have uh, on your on your to-do list to go through that acceptance workflow that I just showed you in the previous in the previous few steps uh, on how to go about accepting that exam for your own. But we're now focusing on Lend First, so I'm just going to plug in a fictitious start date for this one, and we'll kind of ignore this company going forward. Continue to confirm. And so there are the two decisions I said where we're going to leverage another exam, which is on the LendSmart. And then I, I decided to go ahead and schedule a single state exam for first, second mortgage. So we can go ahead and proceed with these decisions. And we now have the ability to leverage this exam. So with a leveraged exam, the way you the way you need to go about this is again first you need to go ahead and request access. So when you need to kind of follow that same flow that we had done before, and uh, re make the request from the owning state agency. Uh, from that point, um, you'll be granted that that uh, acceptance, and then uh, I'm gonna I'm not gonna go through that entire workflow again because it's a lot of jumping roles and I think it's a, a little time consuming. But once you're granted access, you then have the ability to kick off a supervisory activity on that company, leveraging the examination that you now have access to, in this case, from California. 
So to do that, we're going to go and open up an exam just to kind of show you uh, the way that would work in, in practice. Imagine California had granted me access to that, that supervisory record, 10 0 or 1011. In order to start my leveraged exam of this company, you initiate the supervisory activity. And this should look very familiar. This is the exact same way you would be initiating a full scope or a limited scope exam, because leveraged exams are just a different scope type. So you fill out these basic details. And then you have this new scope type called leveraged. And in leveraged, you put in the SAID of the examination that you have access to, that you've requested access to, and you go to the next section. And I did this on purpose because I wanted to show there are a number of validations that, that appear here when you're trying to leverage another agency's exam. The first is, as you can read here, you have to have access to that. So I showed you I had not requested access from California yet, so therefore I cannot leverage exam number 10011. I have to go make that request to California first. The other validations are things like uh, the, it has to be an active uh, SAID, meaning it has to be an active, or it has to be an actual exam in the system. The examination must be closed. Also, the examination cannot have reached its expiration date on the, on the uh, category B document retention, meaning the long-term document retention, which is six years. So it has to be within that six-year timeframe. But if you meet those criteria, that you have access to that from the home agency, and that all those other criteria are met, you can then proceed in a very normal examination fashion, leveraging this supervisory activity and proceeding. You would then assign the EAC, and just like the accepted, uh, it's up to your agency to decide how deep to dig on these leveraged exams. You can send information requests. After this point, it opens up in a, into a normal exam scenario. The only difference is you do have some flexibility around not sending information requests, not sending loan requests. You can hop from those different uh, workflow segments more freely than you can in, say, a full scope or whatever exam. That's otherwise, that's the only difference between a leveraged exam and a full-blown, full limited scope supervisory activity. So I know that's quite a bit of demo activity, um, maybe a little more than we bargained for. Um, I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint slide and cover uh, one more quick uh, piece of my uh, functionality that I wanted to demo today, and then I'll go ahead and open it up for questions on either this or uh, what I'm about to discuss. So the the other shifting gears entirely now, uh, I wanted to I want to talk about a new feature that we've added to the system to give you more flexibility around what types of documents, if you are using this feature, you're downloading back out of the system. So the problem we heard from, from regulators was that you really like the ability to bulk download the documents out of the exam, but you don't really like the fact that it's an all or nothing deal. So the solution we came up with is that you now have the ability to choose different segments of documents or different categories of documents at the end of an exam or whenever you decide to do the bulk download. So the categories you can choose are information requests, loan requests, you can still download all documents, or you can download everything except the information requests and the loan requests. So those are the four categories. And just to show you where this is at, I'm gonna back out of this and cancel, and just remind you all how to go about the uh, bulk download process. So if pull open an exam, that you may want to bulk download for. The bulk download option is under related actions. So this is an exam record that was completed back in February. Under related actions, there are several options. In this case, I'm going to choose the bulk download, and you've got those four options. Again, it's pretty self-explanatory. You can download the IR documents, the loan request documents, all the documents on this exam except IRs and loan requests, or the full document set. And again, the way this works is you're sent, uh, you're sent an email notification when your download is ready and a link to go ahead and download that. So those are the two features I wanted to uh, demo today. I'm going to go ahead and check the chat and see what kind of questions we're getting. All right. 
So uh, we got some questions about the accreditation standards. Um, I think that might be a good follow-up question for me to, to work with you uh, just over email on that. Um, the acceptance of exams um, is really separate from leveraging exams. So if you're leveraging, the question was, if we accept an exam, do we have to do transaction testing? And what is the CSBS accreditation standard? Is transaction testing required? I believe transaction testing is required if you're doing uh, if you're leveraging the work of another agency. So in your leveraging workflow, you would need to do some loan review, uh, some uh, in-state transaction testing or, or what have you. Um, however, on the acceptance workflow, uh, that is an outright acceptance of another agency's examination work. And there is no transaction testing contemplated. There is no separate loan review contemplated in that part of the work. But um, thank you for that question. There's more to the story there with accreditation, and, and we are going to work with the accreditation team to make sure these new paradigms are accounted for. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll take an action item to get back, uh, get back with you offline on that question. The exam date, is that the close date or the start date? Uh, that's, a, that's a question in the system. Um, we've got both. Uh, the system, the, the system uh, captures both, and I think the way uh, we present the exam date on the system is the date the information requests are sent to the company. At least I believe that's the, the official start date for, for the exam record in our system. Um, but we try wherever possible to label whatever date we're using as uh, exactly what's happening. So the close date, the start date, um, we, try to, we try to instead spell out exactly what's happening. The next question was, will the bulk download feature be applicable for active exams that already have documents in the SES system? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, the bulk download, I, sh I showed you the bulk download on a closed exam, but you can actually go ahead and download. Um, you can actually use the bulk download feature on any exam you're a participant on uh, b before it's closed. So during the exam at any time, you can go ahead and bulk download those. Again, that's accessible through the related actions piece. So I'm going to keep things moving here. Uh, if, if, if any other questions, please uh, feel free to, to put them in the chat. We'll keep monitoring that. I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay Schmidt to talk about uh, a next enhancement on the list. Lindsay? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. I have just two enhancements to talk to you all about today. The first one is around standard information requests. So a lot of you enjoy the standard information requests in terms of the language and the functionality. Um, but we've heard that sometimes there's a need for you all to communicate something additional to the company about that standard information request. And right now you don't have the ability to edit any of the language in a standard information request. And so the solution that we've come up with is allowing you to add additional information. So you'll see in the screenshot to the left there, there's an additional information box that you can type in to add additional commentary for the company about this particular standard. Um, the, you, the, it's important for us to keep the language the same. Um, and so we, we thought that it would be good to give you that additional text box that would get sent to the company to give them further instruction about how to complete that standard information request for you. So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, this is that screenshot is exactly what it would look like in the system. You can add that additional information at the time that you're creating the information request and adding that standard information request. You can also, um, if you need to update, you know, if, if the company has already responded, you're looking at their uh, information request response and you want to add additional information, you have the option to type that into the company as well. Um, next slide. The, uh, the, the next topic, and then I'll, I'll certainly break for questions if there are any on any of the two topics that I'm presenting, is around depository data in SES. And so, as most of you are aware, we have non-depository information coming over from NMLS on a nightly basis. And so there was a, a need on the complaint side, which um, is there are users on the complaint side of SES now, that they needed the ability to create and process complaints on depository institutions. So those of you that are familiar with NMLS, there's a non-depository side of NMLS, and then there's a depository side of the system um, that belongs to the CFPB. 
And that requires all uh, federal institutions and credit unions to be registered and all of their MLOs to be registered as well. And so we worked with the CFPB to get their approval to bring over that depository data into SES for purposes of being the complaints users being able to create complaints on them. Um, we did, and I'll show the best way to show this really is, is to do a demo, but there is a new company type column in the search field that will you'll be able to easily distinguish using these icons here, whether the entity is a depository or a non-depository. And then as I've mentioned, this functionality is only available for complaints users right now. Um, at some point down the road, we'll likely uh, open it up to allow um, examiners to be able to create uh, exams on depositories, but for right now and for this release, um, only complaints users can um, can create complaints on these depository entities. So I will ask Kyle at this point to transfer the ball to me so that I can share my screen. Okay, and you should be able to see my screen now, hopefully. Looks good. Okay. And so I know a lot of you are examiners and maybe some of you have not seen the complaint side of the system. I know we have some complaints users um, on the webinar as well, but this is welcome to the complaint side of SES. This is the home page. I first want to just search for a depository uh, institution to see to show you what that um, institution record looks like. So I'm going to search for Navy Federal. And this is the this is the Navy Federal that I'm looking for. You'll see here. Um, this is the different icons that I was mentioning that there's, you know, this is a depository. There's nice hover text on here that will allow you to easily distinguish between um, whether the entity is on the depository side or non depository. If I click into this record for Navy Federal. Um, just like non depositories have their own company record in SES, these depositories will have their own record as well. And so all of this information that you see on the screen is coming over from the NMLS system. So the legal name of Navy Federal, their address in Vienna, their RSSD ID, um, who their primary federal regulator is, of course, their NMLS ID. Um, so all of this is, is populated and coming from the NMLS system. Even though um, examiners and those on the supervisor activity side do not have the ability to um, create exams on these entities, you can still view these entities. So even though I'm in the company search on the complaint side, if an examiner were to go into the company search on the uh, supervisor activity side, you could still search for Navy Federal and view their record. You would still have access to view all uh, depository records, you just wouldn't be able to take any action on them at this time. So I'm going to go through here and uh, go over to the complaint side and just show you how you can create a complaint on this uh, on Navy Federal, for example. So I'm going to click enter new complaint. I'm going to click company here. And put in their NMLS ID. I hope I remembered that correctly, and I did. And so, when you put in their NMLS ID, this is a, an, an example of just the summary information that's represented um, on that screen that we were just at. You'll also see here on um, there's a, another indication that this is a depository, and then uh, down at the bottom here, which hopefully you might not be able to see if my picture's there, but you'll have the ability to enter complaint. And then this opens up the uh, complaint intake form, which if you're a complaints user that are that's currently using um, SES, you're very familiar with this intake form. Um, we did not make any changes to the intake form um, based on the depositories being added into the system. So you'll see this is the information that's being pulled over from NMLS. You'll also see here um, you have access to the full complaint details. Um, you have, of course, the business type um, selection of you can choose commercial bank and then your business activities instead of the long list that you're used to. Um, there's just two to choose from, or in this instance, credit union is, is probably most appropriate. You have the ability to pick between loans and operations, and then you would just go on your way here of entering in your description. All of the rest of this um, stays the same for you all. 
And then down at the bottom here, you can choose to uh, to create that complaint. Um, the one thing to point out is that you do still need to go through the onboarding process um, for the very first user at Navy Federal, for example. If you um, if I go back to the company search real quick for Navy Federal. You probably noticed that onboarding button. The one thing to point out here, and this is more specifically for complaints users that are on the call, um, you, you're probably used to seeing coming to this page for the company record and seeing some NMLS contact information. Um, we were not able to pull the contact information from NMLS uh, that we were not. Um, we weren't granted the permission to pull that over into SCS from the CFPB. And so to, uh, you'll likely need to reach out to Navy Federal, for example, or your, your depository institution to get an idea of who they want their very first user to be. And then you would just go through the process of initiating onboarding for, for that company. So once you create that complaint, as I mentioned, the, the process stays exactly the same. You, you can create your information request. You can send it to that person that you onboarded. Um, that company user can log in and respond to the complaint. So the, the, exact, the, the workflow is exactly the same between the depository and the non-depository. So I think with that, I think there probably are some chat questions in there. I'll open it up. If there are any questions on the being able to add additional information on a standard information request, and then any of these, any questions on the depository institutions. Let me get into Lindsay, the chat. One of, Lindsay, one of the, I, I was kind of keeping up with the chat. One of the questions that we got relates to um, state regulators ability to view and see the complaints that are entered by other regulators, both on the mm -hmm. for depository and non depository institutions alike. Can you speak to what one regulator can see from another regulators complaints? Sure, um, so to see complaint information, you need to be a part of the complaints group. Um, so if you are, and that's something that your account admin at your agency can add you into that complaints group. It's essentially, it's a permission. Um, and that would give you access to view complaint information. If you do not, if you're not in the complaints group, if you navigate to a depository record, you will not see this complaints tab here. Um, but if you are added into the complaints group, you'd be able to click into this tab and then see if there are any complaints here. Hopefully that answers the question. It does. Thank you. I think all the other questions in the chat have been answered. Um, so I think we're I think we're up to date on the questions coming in in the chat. Okay, great. I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. All right, so we're going to go jump back into the PowerPoint presentation and cover a few more functions in the system. Uh, I think much of the rest of this is going to be guided through a PowerPoint presentation. So Lindsay just talked about the depository institutions. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alejandro Krasno to speak to a couple of the other features that we've got in store for you in this release. Ali? Thank you so much, Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. To start with uh, this uh, couple of enhancements that I'm going to go through, uh, this first one, the uh, optional notification. Prior to uh, the Connecticut release, a company would get notified when an agency closed and locked the SA. So we heard from agencies that you would like to make this company notification optional and have the ability to decide whether the company receives a notification because in some instances you might not want to notify the company. So now with the Connecticut release, you do have that option of notifying um, a company when, when you're closing and locking the DSA. So here on the screen, you can see a um, the message that you will get when you're when you're when you're closing the SA, um, a notification will pop up in SES that will ask you whether you want to notify the company, and at that point you can decide whether you want to do so or not. And if you go to the next slide, um, Kyle, if you decide to notify the company, the this is the notification that the company will get, which essentially states that. The, uh, the the company will will be notified that the closure of the supervisory activity does not limit an agency's ability to to 
pursue a, a different supervisory activity, for example, an investigation, um, and that, in fact, a an agency can start uh, a separate supervisory activity on the company. The close and lock notification feature has not changed, but we now have uh, given the agencies the option to either notify the company or not notify the company when they decide to uh, close and lock the ESA. All right, uh, moving on to the next enhancement. Prior to the release, when an industry representative was enrolled in the system in more than one company, then that user, uh, when, once it got to SES, had to accept the association with all the companies or reject association with all the companies. In other words, they could not choose whether to say accept association with one company and possibly reject association with another um, company. But now with the Connecticut release, we have changed this. And when a user enters the system for the first time, they can choose to accept the association with one company and, for example, reject the association with the other company. Uh, say my name is Amy Pacos, and I work in the industry, and I receive a couple of requests to enroll in SES. The request could have come from uh, one agency, the request could have come from multiple agencies, I don't know. All I know is that I got a request to, to enroll in SES. In the back end, I'm going to get the notifications, I'm going to go through all the steps needed to be able to access the system. And once I'm in the system and I accept the terms of use, then I am going to land on this page where the system is going to ask me, look, you've got, you have a request to enroll in the system and from and associate yourself with with these companies and at this point uh as a as a user i can determine and decide whether i'm going to accept the association with say for example credit union one or reject association with with that institution and same with uh true north federal credit union whether i i am going to accept that association or reject that association so if I if I reject association with with one um, company, then that again stops the process, and the agency will be notified that that hasn't changed, that stays the same. And um, if I accept association with with um, another company, then I will be part of that that company and um, be able to get access to SES and then follow the next steps in the to finalize the enrollment process. One additional enhancement that we made to this, um, Kyle, if you could go up to back two slides, is that uh, as an agency, you now have the ability to track the history of a company's users, users' acceptance or rejection of association with, um, with, with uh, any given company. So in this case, um, if you pull up my record under a particular company, Amy Pacos, and uh, you pull up my record, you can see now uh, that there's a, a, a red circle and a, and, a, and a green icon. Those icons mean that either I accepted uh, or reject the association. The, the red um, circle means that I reject the association with that company, and the green icon in fact, means that I did accept association with that company. So that's uh, that, that that's the enhancement uh, that we made there. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions. I'm not seeing any right now, Kyle. So I'm going to um, turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Ali. Like we do with every one of these tutorials, we like to just give a, a quick uh, shout out to some honorable mention enhancements that we've got in this release. So be on the lookout for these. Um, I'll try to kind of describe each one of these, but we don't have time to go through and demo each of these today, but I think you'll I think you'll run into them as you cruise through the system. We added a new filter by one or more business types on the supervisory activities tab. So uh, in production, we're getting to in the you know in SES, the, the version that's out live and that you're using, we have over 240 exams, I think, as of this point. And now we have the ability on that supervisory activities tab to filter them by different business types, again, one or more. 
The next honorable mention is, in addition to the EIC, the report response can now be marked complete by the staff user and the staff director. So this was a big deal enhancement, and I, I wish we would have had time to demo this today, but I think I can describe it. Uh, the problem statement was that uh, often in some states, once the report has been, once the report of exam has been written and, and, and submitted up to the office, the EIC has to go on and start working on other reports and doesn't have to, uh, doesn't have time to worry about that report getting uh, sent off to the company and then those responses coming back in from the company if that company, say, provides a response for that report. So if you criticize something in that report and they want to fire a response back, uh, by that time the EIC is long gone and maybe uh, on several exams down the road by then. Well, now staff users and staff director role individuals can review those responses to the report and mark them complete. Uh, the other thing is a new notification goes to the EIC when the primary reviewer sends back the report. This came because we had instances where the EIC sent up the report, the reviewer didn't like what they saw, sent it back to the EIC, and the EIC didn't know that because we didn't have a notification triggered at that point. So I bring that up here because we fixed it and also to tell you notifications are very easy for us to change in the system. So if there's not a notification coming somewhere, please let us know that and we are we will we will work on it and get it built. There's another important missing notification that's not included in this release that's coming up in the next release uh, and that relates to the subsequent transmissions of information requests uh, to a company. So we've gotten some other we've gotten some other feedback on notifications and I just want to let you know that uh, we we prioritize those quickly and can get them changed in, in the next release almost always. And then the last thing is uh, in this release you're going to see an indicator uh, on the agency's tab of the system if they're actively using SCRS or not. So you can very quickly see, uh, if you hit that tab, you can quickly see which agencies among your peers are using the system and which agencies are not. That's driven on whether or not there's an active, uh, I think whether or not there's an account administrator for that agency in the system. So that's the honorable mentions. Uh, we're pretty happy with this release. Uh, excited for it to go live this weekend. Uh, as with every release, uh, the, the system will, will shut down and be unavailable during the update period. So uh, if uh, hopefully you weren't planning to work Saturday or Sunday, but the system will likely be unavailable during the update periods on Saturday and Sunday. And then Monday morning, when you log in, you'll see the new Medicaid release. So that's everything we have for you today. Let me do a quick scan of the chat questions and see what other questions y'all may have. Now is a good time, uh, by the way, to, to ping us if you have any questions, and we'd be happy to answer or go over anything again. Well, I will just close by saying if you have feedback on the system, uh, the email address, and I can put this in the chat, is uh, sesfeedback at csbs.org. That's all regulators are able to submit ideas, thoughts, comments about the system. Uh, if you, like like I said earlier, if you are seeing a notification that's missing or if you're getting notifications where you don't think they're necessary, send it to sesfeedback at csbs.org. The way we take that in is we we bring it to the team, uh, we review it, then we take it off into our SES steering committee and we evaluate a change to the system. If the change is approved, you'll see it hopefully in the next release. Obviously, some changes are harder to make than others, but we do take your serious, or we do take your feedback very seriously, and we want to make sure you're seeing this system evolve in the direction that you need it to go. Uh, the last thing I'll say before I let you go today is that we've got some more, uh, uh, we've got a few more ideas for future SES workshops. Uh, we've had some on the library, we've had some on scheduling. Uh, we want to keep that going with other functions in the system that may need a big, of, a bit of a deeper dive. And so uh, we've got a few more planned. Uh, we'll be getting some notices out on those relatively soon. But if you have ideas on features of the system that you want more information on, uh, a better uh, explanation of what the system functionality does or, or how to use something, let us know that. And we can either connect you with our, our learning and development team, or we can maybe consider that for a deep dive uh, workshop in the future. We really appreciate, I don't see any other questions on, on the chat, so I really want to uh, say thank you for participating today. Uh, we take the survey feedback very seriously, so let us know how today's webinar went and look for that recording on the website as well as an email notification sometime next week. Thanks again, stay safe out there, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.